other techniques that we have, besides making the aperture big, besides making this big, the other techniques that we have that uh, astronomers can improve the image of what they're seeing. The first thing is a CCD. This is the most basic thing. Uh, pretty much all telescopes nowadays have this, just like all digital cameras have CCDs in them now. I remember when the first uh, digital cameras were coming out, oh, it was a big deal. Oh, one and a half megapixel, two megapixel, wow. And then soon you began seeing two and a half, three megapixel. Now, regular phones have cameras in it like 8 megapixel, you know. And then the, the, the digital cameras have 16 megapixel, 20 megapixel. So it's multiplying very, like, rapidly. So essentially, what these CCDs are, are um, they are silicon chips, okay. Um, and inside of them, there's millions of little pixels. And whenever a light ray hits it, a photon of light, it um, activates a, a reaction in the circuit, okay? And so it's a very, very light sensitive pixels and are used instead of photographic plates. They give brighter images. In other words, they can collect a lot more light and produce a lot better image of what you are seeing. Back in the old days, like before digital cameras, digital uh, telescopes, we used to have film that you used to buy, you know, from the local store, and then you wouldn't even see what you were taking a picture of, then you would go develop it. Same thing with telescopes. They used to have photographic plates. They would take a picture, they would go and then develop the film, but that w didn't give nearly as detailed of an image as the CCD ones. So the CCDs are a very, very big improvement. So this picture I'm going to show you <coughs> this gives you an idea of what a photographic plate telescope would have shown you, a certain portion of the sky. If you took a photographic plate and then you developed the film, it would show you one, two, and maybe third star in the background. Uh, the reason the stars are black and the background is white is this is the negative. Then they would flip that and make the background black and the star white, you see. This is the same picture taken with a CCD technology turned on, you see. So this star is this one. This one is this one. Of course, they have to now take the negative of that and make the stars white and the background black. But you see, you get the idea is that this star, all of a sudden, you, re you really see the size of it, and it's much brighter, much brighter. And then this one, much brighter. However, everything else that you couldn't see here, you can now see here, okay? All the details that you, you can uh, see. You see all that? And then what they do is they start adding color to it. Uh, what they do is they take pictures through different filters. They might put a green filter, a blue filter, and whatever. And then they take different pictures of the sky, then they combine them, and that's how you get those beautiful pictures. Uh, and then you can have orange color, more white color, you know, red color and stuff. So imagine what you and I are seeing when we go out to the desert. Even if you go out to a really dark desert at night and it's a really beautiful sky, you're seeing wonderful stars. You're just seeing this. If you're lucky, you're seeing this, okay? Because you're seeing what a telescope would see. And maybe you're not even seeing what a telescope would see, you know? You're, you have no idea that what's out there is actually this, <laughs> okay? So, and then of course, the color ones you wouldn't see, but there are so many other stars out there. There are so many other galaxies out there that we would be able to see if we had a CCD chip planted into our eye, okay? Maybe that'll be the technology of the future, planted in your eye, you know? and you would see uh, the stars. I think we would be just too overwhelmed with it then, you know, just all the stars and stuff like that. <coughs> so it's like the movie Bionic Man, you know, many, many years ago. There was a guy who could see very, very far. But you guys don't know that movie. That's way back in the 70s. I hope they bring that back, though. 
I don't know, it was one of, one of my favorite series. Okay, another technology that you would, the astronomers would use, the CCD is common to even s telescopes that you guys would buy. So it's uh, most of the telescopes you're going to buy, they would have that CCD in there. Adaptive optics, no. Adaptive optics is too expensive. It's only the professional astronomers would have that. They would put all this computer instrumentation, attach it to their telescope, and basically, the idea of the adaptive optics is that it's connected to the mirrors of the telescope and continually fudge and fiddle with the focal lengths of the telescope. Continually change their focal length. So you're constantly adjusting the focal length of the telescope with this little tiny computer, I mean, the, with the computer instrumentation, tiny little fluctuations to compensate for atmospheric blurring. They help make images a lot, lot cl clearer than they would have been if you don't use adaptive optics. Okay, so primarily CCDs make them brighter, but they also make them clearer. The adaptive optics makes them clearer, a lot more clearer, and you don't have the fuzziness, the shadiness that you have with uh, adapt uh, with um, the atmospheric blurring. See this picture I'm going to show you. This picture kind of explains to you why, what, what our atmosphere does, does that causes blurring. You know the song that we sing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Do the stars really twinkle? No. It's because the light that's coming from the star, see wi wind moves pockets of s slightly cooler air across your line of sight. So the atmosphere is in front of you and it's constantly moving and whatever. And by the time that the, the light gets to you, it's kind of the light beam is kind of going back and forth, you see? So light rays shifted from side to side by refraction in the air pockets. So the, the reason stars seem to twinkle is because the light is kind of doing this as it's coming to us. And we say, oh, wow, that's a star, it's twinkling. If you go to outer space, you cannot sing that song anymore, okay? They don't twinkle. Planets don't twinkle, you see? That's one way you can tell planets diff apart. Why don't they twinkle? Because they're a lot closer to us. So the beam of light coming from a planet is a lot thicker, you see? The uh, star is many, many hundreds of light years away. The beam of light coming to us is very narrow, very, very narrow, sharp. Right? So the wind affects the star a lot more. The, the, planet, it, the planet is close, uh, is smaller than a star, but it's a lot closer than a star, you see? A lot, lot closer. So the beam of light coming to us is huge, and the wind is not going to affect it as much, the air, you know? That's why they don't twinkle, you see? So that's one way you can tell them apart. Um, <coughs> The best analogy I can give you why, why this happens is try to swim underwater, like in a swimming pool, and then look at your friends who are outside the water. What do you see? Don't you see this kind of? Very shady, very blurry. The water is doing the same thing to you that the air is doing to this. You see, it's making the light wave going like that. You can never see anything clear, clearly from, uh, from the inside of the water, you know? So what adaptive optics technology is doing, it's, it's very highly uh, advanced. Every time that the wind is moving it back and forth, the adaptive optics technology is compensating for that. You know, It's like if it goes this way, it compensates this way, this way, this way. And then so basically, it cancels out the effect of the air and the wind. So if this is something that you would see with your telescope, I believe this looks like it's Neptune, right? So imagine this is a picture of Neptune with a telescope without adaptive optics, okay? See, it's a telescope, but without adaptive optics turned on. You see how it's very grainy and shady, 
and you know, it's doing that. This is a, a picture of a telescope with adaptive optics. Much, much better, much better, you see, clearer. This is a picture of Neptune with a telescope from outer space, okay? Of course, this is even better than this, right? But in outer space, do you need adaptive optics technology? No, you don't have the atmosphere. So you either build a telescope here on Earth and have expensive adaptive optics technology, or you send a telescope outer space, you, you pay money for sending it to outer space, right? But then you don't need the, that technology anymore. So this one beats all of them. But this is still not bad. <clears throat> okay, another technique is to take the signals of two or more telescopes so that they act as one large telescope. So imagine you had a telescope like this. And then somehow you were able to connect the signal of that with this telescope. And then imagine there's a third telescope. So connect their signals to one computer And then the computer receives the signal from all three telescopes, right? Now, they act as if they were one telescope that was this big. From all the way from the left end of this to the right end of that. So what have you essentially done by connecting their signals? You have increased the what? Starts with A, aperture. You have increased the effective aperture of the telescopes, okay? Huge. If I connect four of them, five of them, six of them, I could keep doing that, you see? Which kind of telescope do you think this would be most often utilized for? Which telescope tends to give you poor resolution and the, uh, the cure for it is to make the aperture large? I just mentioned it a couple minutes ago. Starts with R. Radio telescopes, right? Radio telescopes have large wavelength, so we got to find every technique possible to connect their signals, to make them larger. You could also do it for optical telescopes, too. Optical, infrared, you know, make them as big as possible. This is one particular one, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. This one looks like they are, uh, these are uh, optical telescopes. You see here, one, two, three. Telescope number one, telescope number two, telescope number three. This is the control building and you need all these electrical wiring making sure that you're sending their signal and you want to make sure when you send their signal that they don't destroy each other's signal, okay? A uh, lot of electronics have to go in, into that. And then whoever processes that image here. So it's essentially acting as if it's one telescope. See? It's acting as if it's one telescope this big, okay? So it's a, basically, it's an inexpensive way of building a big telescope, you see? Instead of having to build a huge one, you build these, connect their signal, and this looks like it's like on top of a cliff somewhere, on a mountain, and there's a road here. So later on, uh, when we talk about some of the famous telescopes in the world, I'll tell you some more of them that use this technique. This technique is utilized mostly for radio telescopes and sometimes for optical because you want to make their aperture huge. It helps make the images brighter and clearer because by making the aperture bigger, you're making it brighter and clearer. Segmented mirroring. Segmented mirroring is a way of building 
Another way of building a big telescope by making it out of small hexagonal pieces This one shows you a little bit of the, about this. So it's, see here it says, traditional thick mirrors shown at left are expensive to make difficult to support and cool slowly at nightfall. Expansion and contraction in the cooling mirror causes distortion in the images. And then modern thin mirrors, sometimes called floppy mirrors, weigh less and cool rapidly at nightfall. So one of the other techniques is to build them very, very thin, as thin as possible, okay? And they're called floppy mirrors. Uh, and then it says, they weigh less and cool rapidly at nightfall. They can be made economically by casting the disk of glass in a rotating oven that causes the glass to harden with a concave upper surface. Concave means like this. Ready for grinding and polishing. A lot of time goes into grinding and polishing them. And then these ones here, you can see a hexagonal shape here. Something like that. So what this does is instead of building one large one all of a sudden, you're just putting a bunch of small ones and then melting them together to make a big telescope as big as you want. It says your mirrors made of segments are economical because the segments can be made separately. And that's the hexagonal segments that we are talking about. The resulting mirror weighs less and cools rapidly. One of the first mirrors that utilize this is the Cake One telescope mirror, the two largest telescopes in the world. They're one of the large telescopes. Cake One and Cake Two telescopes in Hawaii contains segmented mirrors 10 meters in diameter, okay? They are made of these smaller pieces, but then when you put all the pieces together, they're 10 di meters diameter. From here, more than the distance of the room probably. That's how big they are. They are on the top of the big mountain in the main island of Hawaii, Mauna Kea. You see, there's two of them like that. So you are in this picture that is here, uh, you are seeing uh, workers, you see here, all the hexagonal mirrors. You are seeing them uh, putting it together, you see here. So they are placing them here. And then what's going to happen afterwards, they're going to start heating this up, heating it up to the melting point of glass. And then the glass will melt, and then they're going to start polishing after that. Polish, 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 surface, surface, surface. They got to make sure it's very concave, OK? And then the end product, when they're done, should look like this. You see? Pretty cool. A lot of technology goes in here. Why are we doing all this? It's our curiosity. We want to know what's out there, OK? Human curiosity is the greatest you know, invention, the greatest um, thing in the world. It makes us wonder what's out there. And then it makes us wonder what's in the earth. What's, you know, basically, it's the core of what makes biologists, chemists, physicists, all of these sciences. What are they born out of? They're born out of our curiosity to know, you know? Especially astronomy, because astronomy is more tied to where did we come from and what's out there, right? All of this work, all of this work is for that, you know? 